Hi everyone. My name is Krishna Veni. Uh, good evening to each and every one of you. And uh, jumbo to uh, all the participants and attendees who are, uh, you know, watching from Africa. Uh, today, uh, I'm I'm basically a psychologist by profession, and I am a chief rehabilitation officer uh, for pediatrics department and Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute, where uh, I'm part of the rehabilitation team, a neuro rehabilitation team. And today, we are just continuing on to what we had discussed about what neuro rehabilitation is uh, in the previous talk. So today, um, we are going to be discussing more in detail about what a psychologist's role is when it comes to providing psychological interventions and assessment for neurodevelopmental disorders. The major um, work that a psychologist does in a um, rehabilitation team is evaluation and assessment. And there are some psychologists who further goes, uh, you know, get further training in terms of providing intervention as well. When there is a lack of uh, uh, lack of professional uh, in the team, there is um, uh, the psychologist can play multiple roles as well. Uh, while psychology is a very vast field and there is so many varied options that individuals with the psychology degree can take, uh, one particular section comes into the pediatric uh, field for psychologists. I would just uh, like to do a basic survey. Uh, I would like to know uh, how many participants or how many attendees are uh, therapists. So you could just uh, write uh, T in the chat box for therapist and P for parent. So I know that who are the parents and who are the therapists. So accordingly, I can uh, address my talk or talk for the day. I would request uh, the attendees to let me know how many of uh, the attendees in the uh, you know in this this okay I see somebody has raised hand um, maybe you could just put it in the chat box like T for therapist and uh, P for parent so that I will know so you can just put great so all right so I see that uh, there are therapists amongst us so I'm going to be talking a little bit in details about the and equipments as well. Uh, definitely a parent also will benefit from this knowledge, especially when you're seeking uh, intervention and therapy and assessment for your children. What do we mean by neurodevelopmental disorders? Uh, we had addressed this in brief in the last this. Uh, for others who have not been able to attend the last uh, uh, talks, you know, uh, this is uh, for you to just understand that neurodevelopmental disorders, any disorder, which is present from the de during the developmental time period and it has a neurological base. That means it is related to the brain uh, and spine-related challenges and these come under our neurodevelopmental disorders. So the neurodevelopmental disorders can contain, according to ICD or DSM, so these are all the manuals that a therapist, a professional therapist will use to understand where the diagnosis is um, placed exactly in which category and so this could be intellectual disability, communication related disorder, learning disorders, motor disorders such as PIC, then we have autism spectrum disorder, we have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Some of the causes of neurodevelopmental disorder could be uh, lack of oxygen during birth, maybe genetic condition, there could be immune dysfunction, uh, there could be nutrition related challenges during uh, prenatal uh, or postnatal conditions. Any trauma during birth can aid in this. There are a lot of different uh, causes that is known to cause neuro. Intellectual disability can be there are core in all the disorders that we are going to be looking at. You have to understand that um, there are some symptoms that are core conditions. That is, these things has to be present for a child to be diagnosed with that particular diagnosis. And there are some associative symptoms that needs to be there in addition. It could exist in addition to the core symptoms, but need not always be there. So one such uh, you know, core symptom for intellectual disability to get a formal diagnosis of intellectual dis um, you know, uh, disability would be deficit in general mental abilities, impairment in everyday adaptive functioning, onset during the developmental periods, 
right so these has to be there from the childhood it has to impair the person's in ability to function in terms of taking care of themselves taking learning something new taking care of their environment the impairment in everyday adaptive functioning could range from social conceptual or practical for social difficulty in understanding others and uh, you know empathy and self regulation in conceptual it could be uh, language math reading writing in practical it could be difficulty in regulating behavior organizing or managing finances and personal care and recreation so individuals on the uh, who are diagnosed with intellectual disability could show these diagnostic um, conditions the diagnostic criteria are best when a therapist or uh, a therapist who are there who are attending i would recommend that always sit with a standardized diagnostic criteria so that you are aware as to um, what exactly uh, which criteria are exactly met for this particular individual and that way you can plan for them because when the diagnosis is done correctly we are more likely to give them intervention that are more appropriate to them so we have uh, some interventions uh, uh, ideas over here when it comes to individuals with id um, that is intellectual disability then we have uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, now you know you have to understand dsm 4 tr was earlier uh, used for the diagnosis of um, for diagnosing all the conditions now we have more updated version that is called dsm 5 that is diagnostic statistical manual that is used among all the mental health professionals and uh, rehabilitation professionals to understand and diagnose properly in this scenario uh, autism we call it a spectrum for a reason in dsm 5 because you can see in dsm 4 tr there were so many other things like aspergers reds and uh, other uh, diagnoses like autism spectrum disorder all of these uh, are now clubbed under autism spectrum disorder so even individual who had very minimal symptoms of autism in the past can still falls under autism spectrum disorder currently so in my practice when i have worked with uh, individuals or uh, adults who have been diagnosed when they were younger maybe with aspergers or um, who have been diagnosed with um, uh, to other you know there autism spectrum disorder or childhood disintegrative disorder they currently all of them come under autism spectrum disorder due to the updated diagnosis um, uh, technique right so autism to remember in a, a small uh, you know compact way is to remember that there are three domains that are majorly affected for these children number one is their social relationship they have difficulty in understanding the mama papa or they have difficulty in understanding the norms of the uh, social uh, society like they may have difficulty in understanding um, who is my sister or strangers and the neighbors the teachers a relationship that we form with so many of the people around us which helps us navigate through life these children on the spectrum will have difficulty in identifying that so that's the first domain that is social interaction is is affected the second one is emotional reciprocity uh this means that it's not that they can't experience emotions it's just that they cannot express them appropriately maybe or even if they express sometimes it may be inappropriate and this is often seen among the uh, you know uh, cases that we work with that these children may end up uh, crying or laughing sometimes where it may not be relevant they may tantrum for all their needs of course we know in therapeutic point of view we understand it stems from frustration but it's not the first go to technique for all pe- all children right then another May, the third major criteria is the repetitive behavior and limited interest that means there can be behavior that are repetitive in nature they sometimes engage in behavior that really gives them uh, uh, gives them calmness only when they have done it repetitively like lining of objects or uh, stimming with objects uh, uh, spinning themselves or spinning the objects these kind of behaviors are seen repetitive behaviors in adults it can look very differently they may like organize certain things a certain way and uh, they may keep doing the same they may follow the routine to the t that they want to make sure that if something spills they have to immediately clean it up 
uh, this of course the behaviors must have been there from young age but as they grew older it got uh, it started to look different in as they grew older right uh, then repetitive behavior and limited interest so that means that these uh, individuals may lack the interest uh, to engage in varied activities they may like what they are for example food if they like to eat french fries they are more likely to only eat french fries right they don't want to explore something new they may not want to take another route while going home uh, we see that uh, by working with our clients that parents have reported that if they take a different turn to go to home the child will actually get a complete meltdown because in the child's mind he is learned it only like this um, maybe that that is there is a limited interest not willing to explore anything more than that so that is uh, a, the main three major criteria that we use to diagnose autism of course there are other supplementary and associative symptoms that has to be met and, and uh, those has to be checked completely properly with a checklist my recommendation to every therapist over here is to take dsm 5 it's easily downloadable online you can just get that and take a print out of the diagnostic criteria of uh, autism if you are getting confused with autism and id and sit with the parents and do a checklist with them ask them do you see this behavior and give them examples of how it could manifest in so many different domains and that can help the parent also get clarity and the therapist also get clarity this is something that i would definitely recommend for all the therapists who are working with pediatric because unless we are not sure about the checklist criteria being met we cannot um, go ahead and plan proper intervention for them attention deficit hyperactivity disorder so this is add/adhd usually it is written like that attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder these are uh, sub so there are two subtypes in this one in which there is only lack of attention and there is one in which there are uh, there is a lack of attention plus there is an hyperactivity see, right it can be a comorbid condition in both the diagnoses right whether with autism or with intellectual uh, disability adhd is um, it can it can have impulsivity it can have emotional instability they are easily distractible there is they are easily restless now understand under the age of 5 years most of the children can uh, show some impulsivity and distractibility they can be restless they can be hyperactive because it's a developmental time period so unless it is really intervening in their ability to stay focused for a task that they like and if, if you tell them okay this is important to you and you need to stay focused and if they are able to stay focused i would not consider them for adhd ADHD can really uh, prevent them from staying focused, and uh, it can sometimes be interest based as well. ADHD is usually given only after the age of five years for this reason, because during developmental time period, um, most of the children naturally go through some of these uh, things. You know, they will they will want something and they will cry for what they want immediately. So we have to be very careful when we are diagnosing with ADHD. or if we are evaluating for adhd again here i would recommend dsm 5 uh, diagnostic uh, criteria checklist take that sit with the parent and see which all domains he is meeting and that will give you some clarity so a uh, cerebral palsy is basically uh, caused whenever there is a challenge um in the, uh, the brain uh, it can happen during birth time and it is observed by either there is difficulty in movement in feeding and eating there can be seizures there can be learning related challenges and the child may have difficulty in maybe holding neck uh, and uh, trunk control to maintain that right so there are some types of cerebral palsy there is spastic there is ataxic there is mixed and acetoid um this is quite visible uh, for all clinicians who are over here one of the uh, a uh, technique that i would definitely suggest is that always see the child when you are assessing when you see the child sometimes if uh, the child has a physical condition you can immediately observe them and that is how we start with our assessment here is first we 
uh, greet the family and then firstly see the child. So that we know uh, clinical to form that clinical judgment to understand exactly where the child is. Is the child has only physical condition, or does the child also have um, any other uh, no physical condition and only it's related to neurological conditions? It's all the more easier to understand that. A Down syndrome is a condition in which a person has an extra uh, chromosome, and uh, this could they could have varied different. Uh, presentation but the most common ones are a uh, flat facial profile they may have an hypotonia they may have um, uh, an almond shaped eye they may have a small round ears uh, these are some of um, the uh, you know commonly seen down syndrome features it's usually seen just by observing them as well and for further clinical assessment you may have to send them for genetic assessments so being a clinician, you should definitely uh, have a team of uh, people around you who are uh, helping you or who can, to whom you can give references to. A neurologist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, uh, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, a pediatrician, um, and a physiotherapist, a, a special educator. So there should always, you should have at least these people in your contact list to whom you should be able to easily direct them to or give them the um, contact or refer them to for further evaluations. Bringing, uh, making sure that the child is getting rehabilitated well really relies on our, in our ability to help them in all angles possible. Uh, my, if I am a my, uh, you know, if I am a professional and I am a psychologist, I have to know what is within my capacity and what where I need to get in other uh, clinicians and other professionals. And that just helps make sure that the child that we are working with excels all the more. Learning disability is a disorder that affects the ability to understand or use uh, spoken or written language or mathematical calculation. So this can be dysgraphia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia is an inability to write properly um, or dyscalculia is mathematical related uh, problems. Um, they, uh, so there are four more types, uh, two more types of this. Dyslexia is uh, difficulty in reading. Uh, they may not be able to put together all of these. So this can be seen in this uh, slide. Over here, so dyslexia we have and uh, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, all of those come under um, learning disability. Learning disability also involves um, slow learner diagnosis, which means basically the child has the capacity to learn, but is not able to process information at the same speed. This, uh, even there is executive functioning uh, dysfunction that can be uh, diagnosed, but this all requires further evaluation, more in-depth evaluation uh, and a cognitive assessment should help us identify this. This learning disability is usually seen when the academic challenges are increasing for a child. So that means when a child is um, in um, maybe uh, kindergarten, we may not observe this. But when the child starts going to first grade, second grade, then we start to realize that, okay, the, the child is not able to keep up with the other norms um, required or the baseline that is required for the child to function in that classroom. And over there, we may observe that the learning uh, disability, we need to start evaluating for that. So this is usually seen in schools. So teachers need to be educated. So in um, in our country, there are a um, lot of awareness programs for teachers, which is done by professionals. In all the schools, there are counselors, uh, in regular schools I'm talking about. So counselors and uh, special educators are, are present in the school premises who always are help, ready to help out teachers whenever they feel the child may have some challenges. Learning disability often go undiagnosed because these children are uh, able to be there in the classroom but may, they may not be able to perform to the best of their ability. So 
so over here even their uh, study style and this has to be evaluated to help them navigate through the academic success a little better uh, learning disability starts at teachers the classroom teachers being aware of this so that they can uh, help or at least refer the child to the appropriate team So the learning disability can have many different varied uh, domains that can be affected. Like you can see over your language processing, phonological processing, uh, executive function, memory and attention processing speed. So what we understood or what we have gone through so far is basically what are the different types of neurodevelopmental disorder. Now we are going to be moving on to the assessment tools that we use uh, to uh, assess. Understand that there are um, so understand that there are many uh, different assessment tools available. A psychologist is trained to assess and understand as to which exact tool would be appropriate for the population that you are working with. As part of our training, and a psychologist is trained to understand that what that uh, scale would mean and what is the psychometric soundness of that scale or whether it's a diagnostic tool or is it just a scale uh, to understand the level, right? Or there are some skills which just help us get the level of severity. So it's very important for us to know that these assessment tools that uh, we are choosing should be the most appropriate one, keeping in mind the age, the country where they are from, uh, the psychometric soundness, the validity and reliability, and what are we trying to assess in them. For um, the practice that I am currently doing, yeah. right. so when uh, uh, whenever there is a diagnosis that needs to be made for a child on the spectrum. Childhood autism rating scale is used. Uh, this is something that we use very extensively in our uh, in our um, in a practice in, at the hospital. Uh, it's a very simple and, and a very effective tool provided the uh, therapist is trained to use this. I have also met some speech therapists who have been well trained to use this and have been able to implement and use them well. However, um, it's best if a psychologist or a pediatrician uh, uses this scale. Um, the childhood autism rating scale is basically there are uh, 14 uh, questions that we ask related to those domains. We ask questions and these questions are then scored from a score of 0 to 1. Uh, 0 to 4, sorry, where 0 means there is no challenges, uh, 0 is not applicable actually, 1 is uh, no challenges at all, or uh, 2 is mild problems, and uh, 3 is moderate level of challenges, and 4 is severe level of challenges. Uh, there are some uh, age criteria for this particular scale, we use it, uh, the starting uh, age range is for uh, 2 years, up to 13 is uh, for this, this particular scoring technique. Then post 13, the scoring uh, in scoring interpretation changes. And the total tally of the score after we do it is further classified into mi mild, uh, minimal to no symptom, mild to moderate symptoms, and severe symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. Then we use the autism rating scale. This is a parent uh, and clinician rated a uh, six subscale test wherein uh, there are different questions given and the person is asked to rate each of those statements from a score of 0 to 3 where 0 is uh, not like the individual, 1 is not much like the individual, 2 is somewhat like the individual and 3 is very much like the individual. And post that the scoring is done and we have a conversion scale for that and based on that we get something called as the autism index. Uh, the autism index uh, which helps us understand whether if the score is below 54 
then unlikely the probability of autism spectrum disorder is unlikely and then if it is 55 to 70 then it is probable 71 to 100 is level 2 and more than 101 is level 3 and so level 1 level 2 level 3 it helps us put the um, severity of the uh, child into these three levels now what is good about this is now uh, what that level means it means that a person who's on level one would require minimal support for the person who's on level two would require substantial support and for a person who's on level three will require very substantial support uh, you have to understand that this uh, took place when dsm5 came into uh, this where they didn't want to just put it as mild moderate and severe as a condition they wanted to move more towards a supportive nature and that is why this minimal support and requiring substantial support came into place and Vineland social maturity scale is another scale that we use uh, ideally we would like to understand if the child has any IQ related challenges but it may not be possible for uh, all of uh, you know all the children to be that, uh, assessed with an IQ assessment in that scenario, we do something called as the Vineland Social Maturity Scheme. Uh, we use an Indian adaptation of that. And uh, it helps us understand something called as the SQ, that is social quotient. Social quotient has the highest correlation uh, of about 0 0.80 with IQ assessments. And it has about eight areas that it helps us assess to know how independent the child is and how much more support and how much Far away is he from his particular age? This would mean self-help general, self-help eating, self-help dressing, self-direction, occupation, communication, and locomotion. It has about 89 items that is further you know, it's divided into year wise. And it's a very simple and easy scale to use. But um, the thing is, the child should be able to do all the things independently. Then the child gets a tick mark in that item. And uh, we keep continuing till the child is not passed one particular year or not uh, completed one particular year. And then a calculation process is put into place and it helps us understand what is the social age of the child. Social age is basically how much age of understanding, what level of understanding does the child have right now. So we may have a child who is 14 years old, but the child is understanding at 8 years old. And we get to know that by using this scheme. Or the child is doing things that maybe an eight-year-old should be doing. So those kind of things help us put things into perspective and helps us plan. Okay, so I need to start planning for an eight-year-old therapeutic intervention rather than 14-year-old. There are uh, many different, uh, uh, you know, research papers available on this for Vineland Social Maturity Scale, how to administer it and how to score it. Then we have MCHAT. MCHAT is uh, used usually for, uh, usually used by ABA therapists and people who are working on behavior challenges. Uh, modified checklist for autism in uh, toddlers. This is something that uh, it's widely used in the US. Uh, while I don't regularly use it, but I do use it for clients where required. Yeah. So it's a simple yes or no, and there is an age range for it. It's usually done. Uh, children who are much younger, below five years of age. Then we have ISA, which is uh, Indian scale for assessment of autism. Uh, this is an Indian um, constructed uh, scale. And the ISA is again similar to Gilliam Autism Rating Scale. There are each statements and about Likert uh, scoring technique, where uh, zero to four, uh, zero to five is the marking uh, you know this and according to the percentage of seen the behavior seen and a particular percentage is given for those scores and it is marked now uh, then after marking the tally is done of that and the tally is um, used to interpret using the table that is uh, currently seen by you then there is inclined diagnostic tool for autism spectrum uh, as disorder this is based on the dsm4 guidelines uh, so, it is kind of outdated, but it is still being used among uh, many different uh, clinicians. And uh, this can also help you. You feel that, okay, the current diagnostic criteria is not helping you assess properly. So, you can definitely 
use um, you know you can definitely use this to see if there is a presence of aspergers or any other condition developmental screening test is similar to vsms it helps us understand the dq of the child that is a developmental quotient and it also helps us understand the developmental age of the child now it uh, consists of items assessing maturity in the major areas of motor development adaptive behavior language development and personal social behavior all right so so far what we have spoken about is all about assessment and evaluation uh, usually when we first start the first thing uh, when we start working with any client the first thing that we do is assess them without assessing we do not know what is the challenge where we have to start and how much intense uh, rehab would they require so this uh, evaluation will help us put it into perspective as to how much of uh, challenge they have and how much support they would require from a rehabilitation team right so so far i hope uh, all of you have got what i was saying i would like maybe all of you can raise your hand to let me know if you are in you're following what i'm saying or if you have any question or answer wonderful thank you good so moving ahead so we have some uh, home programs when it comes to home program which is a very important part of uh, assessment and evaluation right uh, once we do the assessment we do the evaluation we understand where the child is at the child is at moderate level of challenges the child is at level 2 or the child is at severe level of challenges the child may have a comorbidity that is a condition of one more diagnosis along with the primary diagnosis the child also has a secondary diagnosis what happens the first thing we should do is educate the family we should tell them to start making their home environment appropriate for them to for the child to uh, learn new skill sets right so a psychology after right after assessment evaluation after doing our complete analysis we should come we should understand what are the requirements of the child and then accordingly we need to start training them for that so when we are giving home program of course first is discussing what we have identified with the uh, child and what it means for the child and what could be the prognosis of the child and what all intervention would be required and one such intervention would definitely be home program that means how to deal with the child or how to take care of the child at so some of the techniques would involve pre vocational training for children between the age of 10 to 16 they should start learning these pre vocational training functional mathematics that is giving understanding time concept so that they start learning to do things by themselves they should know that morning time i have to get up and get ready at uh, lunch time i have to you uh, know evening time i have to go out for a walk or you know help in cleaning the house so functional time concept these are some things that will help them stay on task when they are training them money concept uh this is basically again functional mathematics as we first taught again this is something that can be introduced at 9 uh, 10 years of age if the child severity is very uh, high and you feel that the child just needs to take care of uh, you know basic needs for themselves so these are some essential skills that we should be aiming to train them for money concept don't develop immediately we need to first help the child learn numbers the values of numbers and then it is for, then it can be used as a play at home then they you can take them shopping and instead of swiping the card and instead of using mobile payments i would suggest please take cash and make your child pay for the items that they are buying for and this helps them understand that i cannot take whatever i want and i have to pay for what i want uh why we are looking at all of this is that for children uh, with any kind of disability any kind of neurodevelopmental disability uh our main goal and our main focus for all of them is to be as independent as possible to have a better quality of life so that means to make someone independent if i say i'm independent it's because i can get up in the morning uh, take care of my personal hygiene wear the clothes that i have to wear and make sure i'm wearing the clean clothes i can travel from my home to this workplace and i'm able to 
do whatever my work entails i can travel back safely to home and uh, maybe make dinner for myself and eat it right so what this means is that i'm independent i'm able to take care of myself i'm able to hold an occupation uh, as per my mental uh, caliber and i'm able to take care of my environment maybe cleaning my home making sure my work environment is also hygienic and safe for me right this is called as independent living and this is exactly what we want our children to do at their capacity so when when we are talking about these concepts of money concept and time concept that is what we are referring to to do list this helps them make more organized thought process they know what they need to do uh, what all things i need to get for uh, myself house cleaning and chores making them more independent and letting them know that they can achieve autonomy by helping uh, family members uh, by helping themselves as well visual schedules are very good way for young children to learn what they are expected to do often times parents may get very overwhelmed and may keep repeating the same thing over and over again uh, and that can put frustration in the child as well as the parents a visual schedule is a good way simple effective and just something that they can see and do without any but right so let's uh, assume that again going back i'm going to keep going back and revising what we have discussed we have understood what assessment what are the types of diagnosis uh that are there in neurodevelopmental we have spoken about the assessment and evaluation to understand exactly what is the diagnosis and what is the severity of the diagnosis right after diagnosis we need to help the parents understand that what it means to be to have this condition and what are we aiming for that is independent living and uh functional independent living and uh better quality of life a psychologist as i said certain people who are trained further may en- may engage in for uh, training and may be able to provide these kind of uh, strategy so my team uh, the team that i'm working with currently is trained to provide uh, behavior interventions which is basically a concept of behavior therapy and aba is a very well known um, therapy style of behavior theory right? which is often uh, studied by all psychology students so application of behavioral principles to everyday situation that will either increase or decrease targeted behavior and that is the concept of aba applied behavior analysis it uh, started in the us and it's one of the most uh, researched therapy technique for the children on spectrum and other developmental conditions so there are two things in aba one is modification of behavior or uh, bringing out more appropriate behavior and a uh, second part is the skill acquisition so whenever a child is uh, unable to uh, uh, you know uh, use appropriate behavior to convey their needs uh, they also work on skill acquisition along with modifying this inappropriate behavior so one video that you can see over here right now is basically called as prompting it's a strategy that is often used by a thera- uh, by a therapist to train when uh, in aba so this is as you can see i'm pointing to the place where they need to uh, put the button properly uh, this is prompting technique that is used in aba and behavior training then this is as you can see again command following if initially he was giving a physical prompt the therapist was giving a physical prompt and uh, then he removed his hand and he just gave him a verbal prompt so prompts are very important when we are working with developmental uh, disorders what happens in prompts is that it helps reduce the stress uh, for the child to actually perform a task if i ask the child give me the pen okay now what i have done is i have given the child two two commands together one maybe the child doesn't know what a pen is doesn't have the vocabulary capacity to understand what a pen is and second is a verb that is give me maybe the child doesn't understand that in that scenario what i need to do is i need to prompt the child so that the child knows what is expected out of him and prompts is reduces frustration and it helps the child learn without getting angry and upset about the fact that he doesn't do something so the pen is here i'm going to uh, tell okay give me the pen the child doesn't understand i may just point to the pen and as a child to give me with a uh, lot of actions 
uh, gesture, so gestural prompt, verbal prompt, and physical prompt. So if the child still is not able to understand, I may model it for the child. That is, I will take the pen and put it in my hand and say, give me the pen. So that is modeling, right? Then if that also is something that the child is not understanding, I may take the child's hand, make the child hold the pen and give it to me and appreciate the child for doing that. Uh, a rule thumb is that anything, any consequences that follow right after a behavior, that is, say, if I want to reinforce that behavior of giving me the pen, I'm going to say, well done, good job, oh wow, or great work, or give a high five to the child immediately. Right? Uh, I want um, some of us to also think about movements. When we were given a reinforcement then and there, um, how likely have we continued to do the same behavior? This behavior can be seen in so many situations around us, right? Um, if there is something positive, say you cook something very nice and um, you, everyone who came for dinner that day came and told you that, you know what, you made this very yummy it was. Now, because you got that feedback, you're more likely to cook the same kind of dish every time somebody comes over. Same goes with our dress, right? If somebody uh, appreciated you for the dress that you're wearing or you're looking good, you're more likely to repeat that. So ABA is basically a, a applied AB, like behavioral analysis is specific to developing some things that are already occurring in the nature. Whenever we uh, skip a red light in the signal, right, in the traffic signal, what happens? We get caught. We have to pay a fine. So it works as a punishment for us. Uh, whenever someone or uh, maybe a boss tells you you're doing a wonderful job, you're more likely to put in more effort and take in more projects uh, your way. So these are some ways where we are also getting trained uh, behaviorally. However, we are using this exactly how we want for our children as well. So this is not something that is very different. It's something that we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis. But when we are working with our children, we are more particular about what we are going to be doing. So cognitive training. So psychologists work on assessment, evaluation and therapy. We have understood assessment, evaluation. We have understood the therapeutic intervention begins by providing one, the behavior therapy. Behavior therapy or well-known behavior therapy technique is the ABA therapy. Then we are coming on to the cognitive training. So psychology majorly works around cognition, behavior and emotion. These three are the major domains of psychology, uh, you know, practitioner. So we have covered the behavior therapy. We are going to be going to the cognitive training. And cognitive training is basically ability to learn, retain information, recall them, organize your thoughts and um, your language acquisition. All of those comes under cognition. So cognitive training can take varied forms. Usually for children who may have intellectual disability, we might give them cognitive training. This would mean that we give them tasks like puzzles, we give them uh, challenging tasks, worksheets like mazes, word search, depending on their level, of course. Then for ch children with uh, cerebral palsy, even their cognitive training are very good. Even for children with autism, when we want to challenge them and then when we want them to understand and comprehend a little better, we may provide cognitive training for them. Uh, cognitive training is basically any task we give our children or uh, uh, the client that you're working with, with an intention to develop one particular cognitive aspect. It could be attention, it could be memory, maybe you want the child to remember what all we saw, so you may give a plate of different items in the plate, then you cover it up and ask the child to identify those in a picture form. So, it, the, the activities may look different for different children, but everything is aimed at developing the attention span, the learning capacity, the memory, their organizational skill, their working memory. So, if I saw this, then I have to remember and maybe apply it somewhere. So, copy designing. All of these are good ways to incorporate more cognitive training in your practice. All right. So, uh, behavior, we have done cognition. And uh, the emotion part, I would like to address that as well. Emotion, especially in autism, is quite challenging to understand because they have a problem in one of the core symptoms is that they have difficulty in understanding, processing and reciprocating to emotions. 
then in that scenario how are we going to teach them how to express um it's it's always good is when you're working with pediatric uh, population to be a little animated when you are a little animated it's a voice modulation you are expressing your emotion and children are more likely to pick it up right so that's a good way for us to start uh, how to catch their attention to ensure that they are paying attention to us when they are paying attention the pediatric uh, children are paying attention in, in our session the other way is that you can introduce worksheets or pictures of children with different emotion so that they at least are to recognize those emotions happiness sadness we can always start with basic emotions sadness happiness anger upset hungry so all of these can be one basic uh, level of emotion that we can address you can also enact it with them in front of a mirror by making facial expressions you can also ask them to copy you so these are some simple ways that you can always start to work on emotion identification because when they identify their own emotion they are more likely to uh, it will be more likely that they you, they can also navigate it to uh, navigate through those emotions a little better i uh, understand that often times uh, at least in developing countries the challenges comes from the fact that we are very cognitive based and not sufficient emotion based right uh, our emotional um, training doesn't happen and take place in most of the the uh, schools and uh, uh, therapy centers we are more focused on what all cognitively the child can do and somewhere maybe shifting that can also help shifting that perspective can also help us in making sure that the child is developing all around so if emotional training uh, for children who can express themselves a little more better who can identify these basic emotion i would suggest something called as the zones of emotional regulation that is a very good strategy for our children to be able to navigate through different zones uh, there are movies that can be used for emotional regulation for expressing their emotions better or to talk about emotions there is inside out and movie by disney an animated movie beautiful movie and i often whenever i'm working with teenagers whenever i'm working with children who have that vocabulary and who can as it watch a movie i definitely recommend it to them so what is expected out of a therapist who is working in a pediatric population right there are some uh, qualities that as a therapist we must definitely imbibe within us one is compassion towards children you know children are uh, they are like a mirror in front of us so when we show compassion they also uh, learn those behavior from us how do i know this because um i have worked with cases like, uh, who have picked up aggressive behavior just because their parents were hitting them so explain this to the family members or i know sometimes it's very frustrating for parents and um the correcting style can uh, the correction technique or um, the way of punishment can sometimes be punitive in nature and but that should be avoided wherever possible so that means that showing compassion that one the child has a challenge but we have to do everything that we can do to support the child to learn better right that doesn't mean we treat the child too special and the child just doesn't learn anything and or maybe become learned helplessness develops more in the child but at the same time i want us to know that the child will grow well if a compassion is shown towards the uh, child often when we see so many cases together and continuously we may lack that compassion so uh, my one number one tip for all therapists is to take a deep breath before you start the session and that can immediately bring you in the current space and be more mindful empathy empathy is understanding that the other or the family member or the child or that we are working with as a challenge and they are trying to navigate through this and you are trying to understand how difficult it must be for them okay it is not saying oh my god this has happened to you i'm so sorry that is sympathy empathy is basically we understand it is challenging for you but what can we do further to go ahead from here? and that is something that i want all therapists to imbibe in them that is empathizing with the uh, the child while you're working with them or with the family when you're working with them trauma informed now this is very important in the current time and age because 
uh, trauma informed is a rather newer uh, under, uh, you know school of thought in the psychology field often time some strategies some techniques that uh, as a therapist we may but may not be actually um, very conducive for a child to develop in and um, this can help uh, this can actually demotivate the child to achieve certain things so using punishment and uh, you know or any punitive kind of intervention is definitely not an ideal way to go ahead uh we uh, have seen that when these children when they are young and are being often exposed to these kind of punitive kind of therapeutic intervention or punishment intervention they may actually develop a uh, difficulty much later in their uh, life especially during teenagers teenage uh, years they may develop depression they may develop anxiety they may develop other kinds of condition so it's always best that we keep them in an environment that is rich for them to grow this is very important a team work as i said a professional team you should always have a team of professionals that whose contact you have whom you have connected with you can refer to whenever there is a challenging case wherever there is their expertise required another team work is with the parents it is very crucial let me tell you when it comes to a child we have no idea about what the child is because we don't spend the time with the uh, the child the whole day the parents know the child best and we have to accept we may have the clinical knowledge but the parents are the best judge of their children and they know their children much better than we do we may bring in our clinical expertise over there but that doesn't mean that we know the child better so parents know their child the best so always keep them in the all base keep them in the loop all these plan things with them they will be able to better identify what the child is lacking they can so goal setting and all therapy planning must always involve parents it can't be just about what we think is right for the child another very important skill set that the um, uh, you know psychologist must have whoever is working with pediatrician is documentation documentation plays a huge role in one ensuring that all the data of the child is recorded properly so you will be able to refer to it and understand uh, where exactly the child is or how much the child has progressed and where he started from to understand the therapeutic uh, uh, intervention if it is beneficial or not third in any scenario where you need to transfer the case from one person to another um, or you want to uh, you know you want to hand over the case to another person the documentation will help them form better con better clinical judgment about the case when documentation is lacking uh, you also lack the ability to formulate proper therapeutic intervention for them and when documentation is in place you will see that it's so much more easier for you to plan therapeutic intervention for the child that will actually benefit the child and help the child grow ahead evaluations especially psychological evaluations uh, iq assessments and cars and gas must be done on a six month basis so that the improvement of whatever uh, we are uh, giving whatever therapy we are giving is it really helping and benefiting the child so that will be sh uh, that will be seen in the evaluation report uh, through scale, uh, scales and scores making it more objective to assess so therapeutic goal setting now we have discussed so far about uh, the first element was about assessment and evaluation we have understood different types of test that is essential for assessing and evaluating and uh, we have addressed how it has to be conveyed to the parents and a home program must be provided to parents so that they can start incorporating and making the child more independent in their regular setting as well we have spoken about qualities that are essential uh, therapeutic interventions that are given to children on the uh, spectrum and other neurodevelopmental disorders which incorporated behavior emotional pro uh, emotional uh, counseling and other kinds of strategies and um, cognitive training we spoke about what are the qualities that should definitely be there and you should as as a skill set development for yourself you should definitely try and enhance that more and now we are moving towards another very important technique uh, called therapeutic goal setting which uh, must be done by all the clinician who are 
uh, you know, working with neurodevelopmental disorder, that is setting goals for therapy plan. Now, goals, what are goals? Goals basically is a direction for us to go somewhere, right? It gives us an idea where we are headed. So, if I want to, if I want the child to brush uh, his teeth independently, say that is my goal, then I will start planning and applying strategies to develop the child's uh, grasp of the brush, right? Help in identification of the brush and uh, unscrewing the toothpaste and uh, using the pinching technique to remove the toothpaste, then a uh, brushing. So I may start teaching the child direction, like up and down, in and out. The, uh, then working on oral motor muscles to spit, which uh, will help the child gargle his mouth better. Right. So imagine now my goal was brushing teeth. Right. And uh, now I know these are all the things: motor skills, uh, fine motor skills, identification skills, cognitive skills, oral motor muscles. All of these are essential to achieve that goal. And that is exactly what goals do. They give me a direction: what all, which all team has to be involved, what all needs to be done, and what activities has to be given to the child. So setting the goal is the first step when it comes to therapy plan. So if uh, usually when we set goals, these are some uh, strategies that we also give to the parents is to set goals uh, for their children too. Uh, so they are aware where they are headed when it comes to therapy. Right? One is setting specific goals. What do I want to accomplish? Measurable. How will I know when it is accomplished? Achievable. How can the goal be accomplished? Okay, is it uh, from, you know, uh, after brushing, maybe we can move on to teaching the child to take a shower by himself. Relevant. Does it seem relevant and currently is it important? If a child is not going to the toilet now, he is not able to go to the toilet by himself, I would not keep brushing as a goal for him. Right? I would first definitely work on toilet. He will be able to go to the toilet by himself as a goal rather than brush. While parallelly some work can go on on both the goals, but our first primary goal should definitely be toilet training because that creates all the more challenges for the child. Time bound. And when do we expect to achieve this? When we are clear on these five aspects, this is an acronym for this is SMART goal setting. SMART. SMART stands for S for specific, M for measurable, A for achievable, R for relevant and T for time bound. What happens in this scenario is whenever there is a SMART goal in place, uh, we are very clear on what we have to do. So, I want, uh, I'm going to do, uh, I, I want all of you to open up your question and answer a chat box. Um, and I'm going to uh, give you two examples over here. right? And I want you to tell me which one is appropriate. So, example one, the first one is that the child's attention uh, will improve. His goal a, uh, goal one, okay? And goal two is the child will develop attention to five minutes uh, for non-preferred tasks within one month. So, which one you feel is a smart goal? I want you to put the one or two, depending on whichever you felt was correct. I will repeat the examples again. The first example, that is number one example is the child will develop attention. Okay. And the second example is that the child will develop uh, attention to five minutes uh, for non-preferred activities uh, within one uh, by, by one month. So you can just let me know in the chat box as to whether you think it is the first one. So you can put if you think the first one is the correct one and you can put that or second one is a more smarter goal. Then you can put that in the chat box. Wonderful. Great. You're right. So, um, Norbert and Archimondo, right. You're right. The second one is a more smarter goal, right? Because I'm very specific. I'm talking about attention. I know that I want to work on attention span. The second one is measurable. I've told that I want to measure. I want the child to sustain attention for five minutes. 
which is very good i can put a timer i can observe and measure it it is achievable because uh, assuming usually children's attention span range anywhere from 30 seconds to 2 minutes um at a young age so it is definitely an achievable goal and it is relevant attention is most relevant prerequisite skill for all learning so attention is a relevant goal and it is time bound i have given it a time period of one month which is i think uh good right so it can easily be achieved these goal setting when you train your parents to also set and when you train your team members in your uh, clinic in your um, uh, professional networking when you start doing this you just notice that things get so much more easier for the parents also to communicate what is the expectation out of us for us all to also to let them know what is possible and um, that we can give that support So goal setting is definitely something that I would recommend for all clinicians who are over. Another thing that I would recommend for uh, usually a psychologist. should definitely be incorporating our group therapies group therapy can be done in conjunction with uh, multiple teams like occupational therapists special educators speech therapy so these are group therapies that can help children to learn to share to develop social skills to understand the concept of waiting to understand um, emotions of each other uh, to uh, learn uh, you know social behavior group therapies are something that must definitely be provided at your uh, therapy center you are working there at least once a week this helps our children on the spectrum to better learn social skills and even id children to show, share and ask for things appropriately uh so uh, we have come to the end if you have any questions you can type and put it in the question and answer uh just to go through uh, uh whatever we have discussed i would like to just run through them to help all of us be on the same uh you know like a revision for us number 1 is assessment understand a psychologist can help in assessing and evaluating that is putting things into the severity level once the severity is understood we need to uh, the psychologist may move on to plan for um the uh, helping the family understand what it means and what are the home based intervention they may have to start immediately right and to make the child independent and to have a better quality of life then from there we move on to a uh, very important aspect of therapeutic intervention therapeutic intervention can incorporate uh, can involve uh, aba behavioral analysis can have cognitive based training can have emotional uh, regulation based work right so emotion cognition and behavior these three a psychologist can work on for therapeutic plan post which we will be moving on to uh, helping with the um, you know we need to also understand the skill sets that are important for us to qualities or a skill set that our therapist must definitely have then from there we move on to understanding the importance of goal setting in therapy plan so goal setting this is very similar to iep plan i can say like you know individualized educational plans that are made by a special educator this is often done by them as well so this can help you understand um, what you want to achieve with uh, the child and this sets the tone uh, right and it helps all of us plan for ahead and it keeps us going proceeding for another therapeutic intervention that must be incorporated is group therapy while this doesn't come under any particular um, uh, section in the therapeutic intervention but group therapy is something the most effective and the psychologist can help in this as well okay so can we do evaluation at 6 and 12 months is very who has asked um we can do evaluation between 6 and 12 uh, month uh, using m chat for autism uh, but uh, usually autism features are seen from 18 months of age 
DS, see, which is a uh, DST, which is a developmental, uh, sorry, yeah, a screening test for evaluation of cerebral palsy and um, intellectual disability and other conditions. DST can be definitely be used. DST and VSM starts from zero years to up to fifteen years. So evaluation at six and twelve months is possible for them. But if you are particularly looking for autism scale. Then I would. Uh, there is no scale that is below the. Uh, there is no scale that is made for children below the age of two. Uh, for me, when I work with uh, children who are say fifteen months and sixteen months and eighteen months, and if I start seeing some symptoms, I administer the cars, but uh, I do not give a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. I just write autistic features seen. And I immediately direct them for rehabilitation. And I tell them that to continue uh, to start with rehabilitation at the earliest, and we reassess the child after two, 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 four, you know, two years of age or after two year one month of age, so that we get an idea uh, about whether the child is actually um, falling in the on the spectrum or uh, was it just a feature of uh, autism that is coming out in a different. So, do you think group therapy can help children with this problem? Group therapy, uh, we have used, uh, we do at our uh, rehabilitation center um, over here very regularly. Every Saturday, we have group therapy for the children over here. And we actually, we have a team who is there prepared. We prepare four activities for our children. One is done by the speech therapist. One is done by the special educator. One activity is done by the psychologist. One activity is done by the occupational therapist. So, so four professionals come together. They plan their activity. Now, this can be activities as simple as sitting in a circle and coloring together. Okay. If these activities involve uh, passing the parcel. Uh, we have an activity for uh, connecting with the family parents. So, we also keep parents in the group therapy. If the parent are not able to join us in the group therapy, then we ask them to observe from far away while we do it with the child. So then we have a balloon dance with the other children. Uh, we have a dance movement activity. Then we have motor planning, where we have a big uh, auditorium where the child takes one item from one and has to go through multiple obstacle course activities to come and finally place it where it is supposed to be. So we plan one for motor, one for cognition, one for, uh, you know, enjoying and one for sharing. Then the speech therapist may actually sing a song and do a full action song, imitation based activities. So there are many such group therapies that we have seen even our children really enjoy. Even though it may not seem like it for us, but they do do that. And um, in the case if they are not able to engage in the group therapy, what we do is we hold them. We don't give them a lot of verbal prompt in group therapy. Then it becomes a big, um, a lot of noise and it creates so much distress in children. So what we do is then if I'm I'm with a child, I'm with um, I'm in the group and the child is not able to follow the instruction, I'll just go behind the child and give the child a physical prompt to do it or do it with the child instead of forcing the child to do it there. So there, my intention is not to teach the child one particular skill. My intention is that the child should tolerate the social. So what is the goal for the group therapy also should be clear. Okay. Oh, could you please share what assessment tools are used for ADHD? I'm sorry. I think I did not add that. Uh, uh, I um, So for ADHD, I have used Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt ADHD screening test. Usually when ADHD we are suspecting, we do uh, three assessments, okay? I first start with uh, taking the full case history, clinical case history. And then when if it is, uh, if during the case history, if I feel it's moving towards more ADHD and not any other neurodevelopmental disorder, then I give the parent a parent-rated diagnostic uh, uh, assessment tool called Vanderbilt. It is easily available online. Now, this is not a diagnostic tool. It's just for us to screen. It's a screening tool. There are two differences. Screening is to just see if the child might be on that and then a further diagnostic assessment has to be done. So in that scenario, then the ADHD um, uh, scale is given to one parent rated. Another one is given to the classroom teacher. So teacher rated. 
then when we collaborate both along with my observation so we have three domain three from three areas we have got information that will help us formulate if the child is actually meeting the criteria for adhd along with the checklist the dsm5 checklist so vanderbilt is one vanderbilt you can very easily find it online vanderbilt university's uh, screening tool then we have corners corners is very nice to uh, it is it's the um, it's it's on the little expensive side and you may need to get a license to get that corners tool but it is a tool that can help you understand everything about the child like even the child is meeting the criteria for autism or for adhd so it's a, about um, it is about 120 questions in that uh, test we do it with the parents we also do uh, observation of the child and we mark it and then after that the scoring uh, helps us understand if the child has any other behavior challenges also like odd um, oppositional defiant disorder you know it also shows for conduct disorder childhood depression all of these gets ruled out corners is a very nice test that can be used if you have access to that uh, but you need to keep in mind uh, corners is a us based so i'm i'm sure we can get norms for different countries as well how do we properly use and articulate the dsm5 when a robot has a question when we want to assess or evaluate and new neurodevelopment problems or any cycle how do we properly implement the dsm4 or oh, dsm4 uh dsm4 is no more in use so my suggestion is get the updated version uh dsm5 because dsm5 came uh into use keeping in mind that um it was not matching with the current needs and now they are they are compiling uh dsm6 as well now what happened is you have to understand that dsm has taken multiple revisions for the same reason they felt earlier we had an access uh, assessment technique access form so there was access 1 access 2 access 3 access 4 access 5 in dsm 3 okay then in that time they realized that these diagnostic criteria and these diagnostics uh, diagnostic um, tests are not well uh you know accommodating all the necessary uh, diagnosis so what used to happen we were either missing out or there were a lot of mis diagnosis happening or uh, some differential diagnosis were not possible so that's how dsm4 came into place that was more research we had more data for that but then dsm4 tr came into place where only the text was revised there is a diagnostic uh, style was maintained in the same way then dsm5 came into place because it was more appropriate with the current research and trend this is very important right as clinicians we need to keep up with the current trends that are in the um, field we cannot use an outdated uh, style of intervention even now uh, so uh, i would suggest dsm5 you can get the pdf very easily online in the case not just uh, drop me a, an email uh, and i can definitely ensure that i can share it with you as well it's a concern um okay i hope i have answered your question um mr norbert it's a concern can we get the slides please yes um thank you for both of the question okay meant to write okay okay sorry okay i understood dsm5 so you want to know how do we use okay dsm5 how do we actually go about using the dsm5 actually is um there are the diagnostic criteria are given there it is given like okay the child has to meet the two criteria out of the four criteria that is given so what i do is i read it out and i explain it to the parents especially in cases where there might be comorbid conditions it might be meeting this case as well as the other diagnosis so you know the diagnosis could be confusing in that case i sit with both the checklist of the dsm5 and then i ask the parent and i read out each of the criteria to the parent i explain it to them what it means and i do the checklist with them i just tick mark okay this criteria is met for this child then this criteria is met for this child so then that means that i can safely say that your child is falling uh, on this diagnosis or is meeting the diagnosis for both also so um, neuro uh, that is the best way to go ahead because oftentimes there is a fine line between some of these developmental disorders like 
uh, even ADHD can be seen in children with autism. But only autism is given as a diagnosis and not ADHD. So I try to, um, a, a simple example that I learned from my professor uh, when I was uh, studying back then is that he said that if you want to become a master at something, do something for, do the same thing for 1000 hours, right? So when you keep doing it over and over again, you become a master in that field. That is one. And second is reading one diagnosis every single day. Uh, if we read every day one diagnosis or at least one page of DSM-5 every day. So I, let's say you want to read about autism spectrum disorder today. So just read about autism spectrum disorder today and nothing else. And that, that will help us understand and correlate with other conditions a little more. Okay. So how do we properly implement DSM-5? For implementing DSM-5, I would suggest reading it every day. Understanding that um, uh, every type, it is self-explanatory over there. It, it is mentioned that, okay, the child has to meet the criteria for this much time period and uh, for this long and has to meet at least two criteria out of four criteria. So the core symptoms and then the associative symptoms. The core symptoms and the associated, uh, associative symptoms. If you have gone through DSM-5, you will get that idea. There is also ICD that uh, I referred to at times. There are some diagnoses that may not be available in DSM-5 or are not comprehensive enough. ICD is International Classification of Disorder and the 11th edition is the recent one, which is uh, published by the WHO. DSM is by the APA, American Psychological Association. So I use both depending on what I need to understand. And um, sometimes to read and assess a case more in detail, I may read both to help me understand a lot more because ICD doesn't have a checklist format. It's more in a uh, descriptive format. So that is another thing that you can use to understand. Yeah. I hope I answered uh, your question, uh, Mr. Nobel. Uh, if there is any other question, you can ask me. Uh, we can send the slides. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is um, in the chat uh, in the chat I'm just writing down my email address and you can just drop me an email and I can send you whatever you need so it is krishnaveni.neurogen at the rate gmail.com uh, I have I hope everybody can see that. It's in the chat. I have put it. So Krishnaveni, K-R-I-S-H-N-A-V-E-N-I dot Neurogen at gmail.com. So any questions that you have, any further support you need, any case that you're working with that you feel you need a psychologist uh, intervention or you need further discussion on this, I would be more than happy to, um, you know, get on board and discuss those cases as well. Uh, if there are any parents who want to understand a little more or may have some queries related to any behavior, you can get in touch with me as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, you know, share my knowledge with all of you. And I think these questions were really good because it helped us understand and some very important and relevant uh, questions. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday ahead. The next week, uh, Saturday, we will be having our physiotherapist, pediatric physiotherapist, who will be addressing uh, more on what kind of uh, strategies are used for cerebral palsy uh, and other neurodevelopment, like what they do with autism. Uh, as a physiotherapist, they are role in neurodevelopmental disorder and they will be addressing more on that. So it will be the same timing. We are going to keep it every Saturday. So you want to get a full comprehensive view, I would suggest attend all of the talks because all of these therapists have been working uh, for many years in the same field doing this day in and day out, you know, and uh, all the therapists who are going to be delivering are people who have worked with more than 4,000, 5,000 cases uh, and have been able to deliver um, and make sure that the child has progressed. All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Sunday. And if there's anything, you can always get in touch with me. Yeah. Take care. I'm ending the webinar for all. Have a lovely evening ahead. Bye.